All right. Hello, everybody. It looks like we are live now. I'm um, just checking uh, the, the settings really quickly because it looks like the audio might be peaking a little bit. Um, so welcome. I'm Scott with Artist Network, and this is Drawing Together. Uh, today we're working on this fabric. So if you're new, you want to know that you can find the reference image in the description below. So check that out as well as the list of the materials. I'm going to go over that quickly. Uh, I just want to do some final checks here, getting my set up in order. So I have the reference image up in front of me in the screen here, and then I have a projection there. So I've got this overhead camera that gets gets this overhead shot, and that's what I use to evaluate my drawing. So I think it's helpful throughout the whole process that you kind of gradually step back. Uh, today we are working with um, some relatively simple materials. This is a tanned toned paper. Um, it's this stuff right here. It's this Strathmore um, tan toned paper. Um, I've used this for several other episodes throughout the series, so you can check to see how that's been used before. The twist today is that I'll be using an ebony pencil as well as the white kind of pastel chalk. So in the past when we've used this, we've built up the darks starting with this kind of mid-tone of the paper, built up the darks using charcoal, then used the, the pastel or a white charcoal to build up the lights. This time we're gonna actually be using the graphite. We're gonna see how they mix together. Uh, so I saw some comments in before. If you have any questions throughout the whole process, feel free to type them out in all caps. I don't assume that you're yelling at me, so it's just a way to, um, for me to see that uh, a question has been posed because we do get uh, a fair amount of comments throughout the whole process. Um, if you do have the ability to work from life, I always recommend that over working from a photograph. Um, the next best would then be a color photograph so you can really practice uh, converting you know, color into kind of black and white. Now in this scenario though, it's a very monochromatic scene. We don't have a whole lot of variation in terms of color. This is all about subtle value shifts um, and in particular putting our control over edges to practice here. This is really gonna push those limits. And we've talked about that a lot in this series, the idea that um, edges are really a key point in, um, in creating a sense of that three-dimensional nature of the object. Um, so the if uh, Charlotte, you're asking what paper should I use? I don't have any tone paper. Um, in that case, if you don't have the tone paper, I think you can apply a lot of the same thinking to this. Um, because what we're going to be doing is building, initially adding the graphite and then building the white on top of it. Um, and so you're basically going to be starting from that light and adding the, uh, adding the, the, the tone to it. And you might be using, you might try using your eraser. Um, if you end up building up a tone over these light areas using your eraser, similarly to how we're using the, the white chalk. So um, hopefully that makes sense. So hello everybody, I love seeing how everybody's calling out where you're watching from. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, I appreciate um, all the comments as we go through. Um, and if you're new, again, know that, you know, I welcome any comments, um, any sort of, you know, criticism of the work, you know, as long as it's respectful and you're pointing out your observations, that can be really helpful for me. So if you see something that might be kind of off throughout the process, or if you have any questions about why I'm, why I'm not addressing one thing at, at a specific moment, just let me know. Um, so we're gonna get into it. I have this cut down. Uh, you can see that on this larger sheet of paper, this is 11 by 14, and I had kind of given myself these boundaries as a little bit sloppy, but this works out to about an eight and a half by 11. So what I did here is I just trimmed it down to an eight and a half by 11. Um, I have some decent light, um, so that helps, uh, helps me as well. So if, if you are kind of working in a darker room, um, the impact of that light on top of the, the tone paper might be a little bit lessened. I've got some pretty strong light here, so hopefully it'll really pop. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. The challenge that I had in the first pass, and I'm really glad that I took the time to do an initial um, attempt at it, is because the proportions are much harder on this than I anticipated. Uh, and so I want to make sure I, I take a little bit more time and care with that um, early on. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm using the side of the pencil. And as you know, if you've been following the series for a while, I like to initiate uh, the drawing using the side of the pencil. Uh, the, one of the main reasons is that um, by utilizing the side of the pencil, I'm scraping the graphite across the surface and it's more easy to lift later on. 
uh, if I uh, if I start uh, with the engaging the point of the tip, it, it or point of the pencil, it will kind of create an embossed line on the page, which can then be problematic to manage later on. Um, so just using the side of the pencil, I want to start to map out the shape of the darks, and I think it's really helpful at this stage to not get bogged down in understanding what is actually happening with the folds of the fabric. You don't want to get bogged down in the weeds. Just trust your observation of the shapes of light and shadow. Uh, and, and make adjustments as you go, but this is all about getting information down on the page relatively quickly. Um, you know, from that point, we'll be able to make specific adjustments and go from there. So um, working with um, your vision kind of blurred, I think is really helpful at this point. Um, so I'm not getting bogged down in the details. I'm just trying to see the overall shape of the light and shadow. Uh, and I want to avoid any sort of hard lines because that's going to make it harder to manage the edges later. We can come back in later with some of the harder lines to define an edge and that'll really help to bring the drawing to life. But if we initiate that too early, it can be sometimes challenging to overcome that later on in the drawing. Uh, and one of the things I'm also trying to do is navigate the shape of the overall shadows. Try to see those big forms. Uh, and one of the things, and I've talked a bit about this when we've worked with previous, uh, in previous drawings on toned paper, um, the, we're going to have a natural tendency to start to calibrate our values uh, to, the, to the paper itself. So I need to hold in my mind right now that there, some of these areas are going to get lighter. Because uh, over time, we're gonna, our brain is going to start to accept this as the lightest light. Um, and so that's, this is one of the big things that is going to be helpful um, for you in developing uh, you know, a certain skill of predicting value. Um, let's see, just checking in for any other questions. Uh, and and the texture is going to be a, a, an element in this drawing as well. Uh, and I want to talk a bit about that uh, as we go through, but for now, just know that it's coming. We're not going to address it early on, though. I don't want to bog you down uh, with any of that. Hopefully this drawing is a little less intimidating than some of the others we've tackled lately. The lighthouse was a bit of a beast. Um, so uh, the, the hope with this one is that it's a little bit more forgiving. You know, I talked a bit about the challenge with the proportions in this, but what's nice about this is that it is more forgiving in terms of that. You know, this is really a study on the way the folds interact and what happens to the light, what happens to the texture, as a result of these folds in the fabric, um, as opposed to really matching individual folds one to one from the with the reference photo, so hopefully uh, you're going to be kind to yourself throughout this um, throughout this drawing and be a little bit forgiving with the proportions for this one. It's not something that is it's true with all drawing. We talked a bit about that for the portrait work, for example, that where uh, proportions become a bit more critical. But in my mind, with something like this, it's, this is really about you know essentially developing an understanding of the physics um, and the way and it, they, they call it light logic, the way the light plays off the fabric. So then you can apply this to other things as we go, you know, as you build up your your repertoire, your tools as artists. All right, so I'm making passes throughout the whole drawing trying to see the big shapes, and I'm gradually adding more information. So hopefully you can see the, the big forms here. Um, and again, this is more about seeing the shape of the light and the shadow than anything. Uh, in the previous uh, drawing with the lighthouse, I had a question about, or a comment in the, the YouTube, in the video um, on YouTube, um, asking about um, using the kneaded eraser to um, define the negative space, and so we're going to talk a bit about that in this drawing as well. So uh, I, I don't remember who asked that question, but if you're watching, that is going to be a factor in this video. 
There's a lot of intricacy in this area here that I'm going to ignore for now. I want to get the basic shapes in there for now. All right, let's see. Just checking quickly. Uh, just checking to see if there's any questions. All right. Um, I'm not sure there's a question up there. I'm not sure I understand. So I'm going to hopefully ask for some clarity on that. All right. So one of the things to be mindful of, again, line work is going to be a really big thing in this. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at these shadows. So here is there's this fold on that, that first, um, you know, the first part of the fabric. And it makes this thin, dark area. But you want to be really careful not to use a line here. Because uh, what this is, this is actually farther back. This is a crease inside there, and the fabric comes out and around it. So if we draw a line, that's an indication to our mind that that's the edge of it, and it's going to pop that line forward. It's going to um, see that as a, the forward element in the scene rather than a shadow that's kind of recessed in there. So I'm just moving forward, adding a, a little bit more specificity to the, some of the dark areas, and I haven't got to the point yet where I'm going to be erasing out. And again, using the side of the pencil, I hold my pencil in this awkward way. Um, I kind of have it wedged in my, my between my uh, pinky and my ring finger now um, to help place it on the side, and then I can stabilize it with these fingers here. Um, so it provides a sim uh, a a grip, a control that's similar to the tripod grip, the one that we use when we typically write, um, but it allows me to, to use the side of the pencil. And you can see it, you can actually get a really fine line uh, when you do that. I'm rolling the, the pencil in my finger as I go, just to keep that this lead from flattening out in certain areas. And I'm doing that more to remind myself because I had kind of let that slip. So I want to remind myself to keep rolling that to engage the, the tip a little bit. Um, now, one of the things that I haven't done that you may be wondering about, because you see me do in other drawings, is kind of wipe it down with the, the, the pad of my hand here. Um, haven't quite done that yet, but that's going to be something that I work into it. And again, there's the complexity there that I'm not going to get bogged down in. I want to see that as a basic shape for now. And so hopefully what, what's happening on the page is that you're seeing almost as though the camera is out of focus right now. Um, uh, Sally's asking, do I carve the point? So I, I used a razor blade to sharpen this pencil, yeah, uh, rather than a... Um, rather than a pencil sharpener. Now, one of the things that's going to be helpful, you know, is I, I, have, I do have my kneaded eraser and I have my rubber eraser. And now I have this new mono sand and rubber eraser, which is, I'm, I'm very happy with. Um, but if you have any kind of standard rubber eraser, that will work for this. One of the things that we want to also prepare ourselves for is that um, the, the white pastel or the white charcoal, whichever you ha may have, um, is going to mix with the graphite. And so we're going to have to clean it up a little bit. So there's going to be some work that we're going to be doing to help um, organize our thoughts and map things out that, um, uh, you know, that we're going to end up having to erase in exchange with the white, um, white material, whatever material you've got. And I'm not thinking about the direction of my marks too much because these marks are so broad that I'm not seeing any directional marks in my shading. If I was, then I would, I would want to start to think through that a little bit, you know, start to look at the way the fabric is folding. Um, but that will come in a little bit later. And so one of the things I also have to remind myself is that the toned paper serves as a certain value in, um, in the scene, in the still life. Uh, and 
So that some of that is going to be left just as the white of the paper. All right, so I'm, I'm getting pretty happy with this stage. Uh, and now what I'm going to be using is my shading stump. Again, the, the tool that I had never used before this series, or very rarely used, uh, and I think I figured out how to use it now, and I absolutely love it. So um, I'm going to be pulling that out in just a second here. All right, so I'm just mapping things out. And as you can see, I'm kind of working around the whole drawing. As I'm making these marks here, I'm looking at what shadow I'm drawing, um, but I'm, I'm putting my awareness on other forms as well to make sure I'm in the right spot. So I'm thinking about some of these other landmarks, some of these other dark masses, um, and, and trying to gauge the distance, uh, the elevation, where is it on the height of the page, um, as, and um, the size, shape, all of that. So again, you want to be building that skill of not only focusing on the mark that you're making, but what's more critical now actually is where that mark is relative to other things as they're forming on the page. And sometimes you get to a spot and you're like, I don't, there's no, nothing else there to, as, a, as a reference for me. So then that tells you, all right, I need to move on to another part of the drawing. And again, one of the things I like about this pencil grip is that it allows me to kind of roll my hand. So if I need a sharper point, all I have to do is kind of rotate my wrist and I get that, that point. All right. So I talked about the shading stump. I've got two of them here. I've got my old one. I got a new one just in case I need it. Um, and I'm using the old one because it's all nice and built up with um, material. And I want to start to um, I want to start to refine the forms a bit using, using this. Um, and what I like about it is it helps you kind of sneak up on the forms. And I can start to be thinking about the, uh, the, the way the fabric might fold. So I'm, I'm looking at the reference photo and I'm, I'm trying to observe the angle and the scope. And in my mind, in that moment when I'm observing it, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to predict. I'm trying to, um, I, I'm trying to practice that. I'm, I'm, I'm going through the motions in my mind. You know, what am I going to do? And I'm going to make, and I make that quick uh, decision very quickly. Um, and then when I when I'm come to the page again, I'm more concerned of making sure I'm in the right spot first. So in this case, for example, I'm seeing these subtle um, bands in the fabric, and so I'm trying to observe those angles um, and give a, a rough estimation of where they're at. Mary's saying, I love the shadow play of fabric. Absolutely. That's one of the things that's really nice about it. And when you see it in painting, when it's done really well, um, it's just a tremendous, it's a tremendous thing. Uh, and what we might do in this one is do some exaggeration of some of the forms. Uh, and then you know, one of the things that I like to do is if you're not quite sure the directionality of the fabric, you know, then switch to a circular motion like this. Um, if you do have a sense or, you know, what direction you want these folds to, to kind of flow in, um, and then try to strike that with whatever material. Again, I have a shading stump in my hand, but that uh, or a blending stump. Um, but you, again, my, the mantra for this class is that you're always contributing to the form. Every tool you have is an opportunity to refine that form and contribute to it in some way. So even though this, this tool is designed to um, smooth out the texture on the page, at that time, it's also an opportunity for me to refine the forms and make a statement about what I'm observing. So, um, so one of the things you can start to do is look at the alternating sequences in the forms. So you have all of these folds and they're each time they're changing direction. Um, and if we can understand or make a decision about the direction of each of those layers, it can help to reinforce the, um, the, the structure of the fabric later on. And so and in, in, at, this, at this pass, you may not really know what direction things are flowing, um, but it's, it's something to start to become aware of. 
And then one of the other things too that's going to be really helpful, we talk a bit about edges, but in the past what we've talked about are contour edges. So those are the edges that define the three-dimensional quality of an object. Um, in this, in the, within, a fat, within a fold, um, there are um, aspects to the edges that are going to be really um, important. Um, and so if we're looking up here, for example, this fold, what happens along that shadow line, that line of termination where it goes from light into shadow, that edge changes from a sharper edge to a softer edge. Um, so um, that, I'm going to dig into that a little bit more as we start to make more specific um, statements in the drawing. But um, I'll move this mark over here. So I'm kind of correcting the proportion as I go. I'm seeing some things that are a little bit off. There's kind of this landmark here. So right in here we have this S turn. That's going to be the focal point for me. So I'm going to sharpen that up um, throughout the drawing. I want to get that placed properly. And here's where I can use the kneaded eraser to start to um, predict where the lights are going to go and start to refine the form. Uh, Kathy is saying you don't have toned paper, so you toned the page dark gray with compressed charcoal and now I'm drawing with an eraser. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that's a really healthy approach to it. Um, just know that you know if the charcoal doesn't lift off the page, um, you know question the paper you're using, not necessarily your technique. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of students get to that point and they start to become critical of themselves um, thinking that they're doing something wrong when in fact it's just the nature of the paper and the relationship between the charcoal and the paper. So just something to kind of keep in mind there. You know, you could also tone it with the um, with graphite. That's something that I did recently. Which drawing did I do that? I can't remember. Um, or I toned the whole page. Oh, I did it at the light, lighthouse, that's right. <laughs> that was the last one. Um, is, yeah, we toned the page using graphite um, that we kind of shaved from the uh, sharpening of the pencil. And that lifted off the page nicely. All right, so again, I'm just kind of working through, slowly refining. There's going to be more work to be done in here. Um, uh, now, one of the one of the ways that you can be use, utilizing a, a, a shading stump like this, or blending stump, I keep calling it a shading stump, blending stump, um, or to tortillion, um, is to grab some powdered charcoal or powdered graphite. Um, and actually dip it in there and load it with that. Um, I don't, I've never actually done that. I've seen other artists work that way. Instead, I just use, um, I just, I load this using whatever material is deposited on the page. And so one of the things we can start to look forward to in this is that if we look at the shadow coming across around this, you know, I, I saw some of you refer to this kind of like a landscape, and I'm really glad somebody brought that up because that's the way I visualize it as well. You know, one of the things that we can start to see as we come around this mountain-like form is the way it's that line of termination where we go into the shadow the, and the nature of that, how sharp or how soft that is. So you can start to make some of those observations and as you see them, you can drop them in, but I wouldn't get hung up on it too much at this stage. You want to keep moving around the whole drawing um, with that idea that you are building up the whole thing at once. Is there a, uh, is there a way to clean a shading stump? That's a good question. A kneaded eraser, just kind of, kind of pressing it into there. Um, is about the best that I've done, but I've never actually needed to clean it um, because typically actually I want to load it more. I, I, my, my general goal is to, to get more uh, material on there. Uh, so right now, for example, it would be a benefit if I had more material on the shading stump so I could get some of this darker. But try that, just try using the uh, kneaded eraser to 
kind of clean that up. All right, so hopefully we can see that now, just through the, the shape of the shadows, the structure is starting to form. Um, and again, that, it's that mantra that I keep saying again, the, the, the idea is that we, uh, you know, if, if we were to stop right now, would we have an understanding of what this is? And I think we would, like we wouldn't recognize this as fabric. Now it's not fully formed, but th again, this puts us in control of the amount of detail. You can take that wherever you want to go now. Um, if we start by kind of finishing and finish as we go, then it kind of locks us in. We have to bring everything up to that, that same level. Uh, so I want to, um, I'm squinting my eyes and I feel like I can get quite a bit darker in here. And I'm observing the flow of the fabric and I'm, I'm using that to help um, with the direction of my mark. So I have some cross hatching and I can see there's a pattern that moves generally diagonally. So I'm using these marks to go that way. Um, but there's also a cross weave um, that I can then run, um, I can use to help inform uh, the, the direction of my hatching here. And I'm not going to give that too much thought, um, but it will help me later on when I um, start to suggest more specific um, texture, more detail in that texture. All right, and there's this cool kind of depth of field happening where you can see that that front layer is a little bit softer. Um, and I think what's what's really important now is that we just we, I got to get this darker. It's kind of throwing off the values. So if I can block this in, and I'm I mean, you can see how I'm going going back and forth, and I'm trying not to have two distinct lines. I, I want these to be, um, I want this to be a relatively even tone. So again, as I'm as I'm moving, I'm gradually rolling the pencil in my uh, in my fingers. Yeah, there's a comment there about reminding of the sand dunes in Colorado. Exactly. Yeah, and you know that I, I guess I started that thought and I kind of lost it. Um, the the use of still life to suggest the landscape is something that you see throughout art history, um, and it can be a great way to um, to help train your your sensibility if you are a landscape painter to practice the still life. Cezanne in particular was somebody who did that. Um, he would set up these still lives, but there's, there's, um, and when you look at them, you almost get a sense that they are, they're landscapes in a way. He's structuring them though, as, as though they, they could be objects, uh, natural objects in a landscape. Um, so I, I kind of think about that with this as well, is that, you know, it, yeah, it looks like those sand dunes, um, in, in here in Colorado or, you know, the other sand dunes. I know back in Maine, we even had some sand dunes. It was pretty wild. Um, but, you know, it's one of the things I, I don't do a lot of still life work, but it is something that kind of sits in the back of my mind when I'm working is how, how could this play out as a landscape? All right. So let me see. All right, I'm feeling you know better about this. There are a few areas right in here that I want to refine, and then right in here. Um, and and at, when I talk about refining, we're going to be refining the um, the proportions as well as the values. Let me see here. I'm trying to. I've got this horizontal axis here. I'm trying to gauge that distance to this. That, that central focal point there and compare that to this distance. All right, it's pretty close, pretty close. I think this might need to come up just a little bit, which is good. That's easier. So you can see I'm being very sensitive right in this area. There's a, there are three layers of folds right in here, but those lines are challenging to really observe. So I don't want to overstate them. I don't want to state something that I can't really see at this point. Uh, I feel like if, you know, if we're going to be um, adding contour lines at the end to sharpen up something or add some emotion or drama um, expression to the scene, uh, I feel like that's best served at the end rather than doing that at the beginning.
All right. Uh, yeah, if anybody's wondering, Tammy just posted a comment that she's going to finish when she gets home. Um, so if you are wondering, this does go up as a recording, uh, so you can always watch it. So we do have some people that kind of watch initially um, and then finish up uh, you know, later. All right, actually, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually work my way up here. I'm going to start to refine some of these areas. And now what I'm doing is I'm really looking at the, the darkest darks and kind of building into there and trying to observe the, the sharpness, the hardness of these edges. Uh, so as I'm placing these marks, I'm kind of gradually kind of feathering out in both directions. I'm trying to keep these fairly soft because this, you know, the, every, with everything being rounded, if I draw a really sharp, crisp line, it's going to, um, it's going to impede our ability to express the idea, idea that this is soft fabric that's kind of folded in on itself. Uh, so what I'm trying to do essentially, it's it's kind of similar to how when we drew uh, the lips and mouth uh, a while back, you know, drawing that center crease in the lips. Um, kind of, you know, there's a kind of a darker core and then kind of feathering it out. So it's not just a hard, consistent line. So I, I'm going to be working now back and forth between using the kneaded eraser and the pencil. I've got my shading stump in my hand as well, but. And now I am trying to observe variations along each of these folds because uh, there are areas where, you know, they're it kind of diffuses a bit more, areas where it's sharper. Uh, so what adds to the realism of a scene is paying attention to the edges um, and looking for changes at every inch, every half inch. Um, it, the, if it's too consistent, then um, it, it's a, an indication to the viewer that it's a, kind of an artificial scene. Um, so hopefully that makes sense because hard, consistent edges don't necessarily exist in nature very often. So I'm just kind of going through, I'm focusing on this area. Now that's one of the advantages to, to laying in and mapping out everything first is that now that I have the general placement established, I can be working in this area for as long as I want, and I know that I'm, you know, not going to have to move it later. That I'm, I can be fairly confident. You know, having said that, you know, that I always say that you have to be willing to move things, um, you know, throughout the process. You know, they, like your everything is up for reinterpretation. So yeah, again, I'm using the side of the pencil, but when I when I need a sharper point, all I have to do is roll my, my hand just a little bit, and then I've got that sharp point, and then I can drop it back down to build up a broad area. Um, and then that, that allows me to, to always have a sharp point when I need it. You know, so there may be an area where it's, it's not, the graphite's not quite getting into the texture or the tooth of the paper. And so if I need to engage the tip a little bit, I can just roll my hand a little bit, do some of these shorter circular marks. I know some of you have mentioned before that you try drawing this way and it's not, not easy. And I would say just use whatever works for you. This is something that just kind of developed naturally for me. So there's no real right way or wrong way. It's all about the principles, like what what allows you to use the side of the pencil when you need it? What allows you to use the point when you need it? Uh, so I'm doing check-ins with the reference photo. Now I'm looking at the sequence of light and dark. You know, that's ultimately what a drawing is, is the controlled sequence of light and dark. Uh, 
And so, you know, I'm trying to observe where, again, where edges are hard, where are soft, where are they soft. You know, I've got some suggestion of that texture back there. So one of the things I can ask myself as I go through the drawing, I'm not going to add any more detail. I want to kind of sneak up on that. I know that's not the central kind of focal point of the drawing. Uh, so I don't want to be spending time on adding that detail unless I'm sure that I want it. And I think the best way to determine that would be after I've established this as the focal point. And then I can kind of sneak up on the detail back there. So that's one of the reasons I'm kind of letting this stay where it is right now. And then right in here, one of the things that's really nice about this um, photo that I found was that it, it has this nice play between um, the direct light and indirect light. So in this area here, we get a little bit of that direct light, but then there's also variations within the shadow side that there's a lot of indirect light uh, that I think is going to be really uh, interesting to navigate. Uh, and then on this, on this particular fold, it makes this kind of triangular type shape here. Um, one of the things that I, I observed when I did the initial study is that it's not either one straight line or a curved line. It can, you can be broken down into compound curves where it curves this way here and then there's another kind of more straight section here and then we, we have a kind of a diffused transition up here. Uh, so if, if, you're, if you're observing your drawing and it feels like everything is kind of consistent um, or you know it's um, it's not quite suggesting the folds. Um, think about breaking apart those curves into sequences of shorter straight marks. Um, and that, that can sometimes add to the realism is to try to observe and look at each of these curves and say, you know, if make a straight line for each section, maybe, you know, two inches long for each section or something and, or an inch. And there's a bit of a shadow here. So I want to be careful not to create too much of a line. So I'm just kind of breaking that, that line up, suggesting that hopefully that'll read more as a shadow when I do that. Uh, so I, I started here, moved back and around. I'm gonna come back around here again and we're just gonna keep cycling through this phase of the, the drawing. Now, do you, so, and again, I'm trying to be mindful of the direction of my marks as I go. You know, so I'm, I, I can't really see the grain of the fabric here. So I'm using these circular marks. And I'm trying to observe right in here that contrast where it's a little bit harder up in here, sharper of an edge. And I can kind of bear down in here a little bit more. Uh, then as we come across, it gets gradually more diffused. And where it gets to the point where you can barely see really where that edge is. It's hard to define where the edge of that, that shadow, the transition from that darker part into the lighter part of the shadow. So I'm just using that, uh, you know, these circular marks, light touch, you really just the weight of the pencil, gradually building it up. Now, right in here, I can, I can observe the, the, the distinct structure here. So it scoops in, and this is kind of the underside of kind of this cave formed here, and it's catching some bounce lights. So it's a little bit lighter. Then it wraps around on top, and there's a little bit more shadow up in here. Um, and then the same thing as we, as we come around from the underside of the cave, we wrap around to the face of this, and there's that line of termination. It gets a little bit darker, not right against the edge, but close to it. Um, all right, good question. Um, can I describe reflected and cast shadows? And so, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's something that we, we talked a lot about early on in this series, defining the three shadow terms. There's the form shadow, cast shadow, and the shadow shape. So the form shadow is, is a lot of what we're seeing here. 
Um, most of the shadows we're seeing here are form shadows. So those are shadows that are built onto the form of the, sub, of the, of the subject. So right in here, I'm, as I'm drawing this, this is the shadow that's on the form of this fold. We come over here and we see this shadow. This is a cast shadow. You know, so there's another fold outside of our field of vision that's casting this sharper edged curved shadow across the surface. And we see another um, for, uh, cast shadow down here as well. And, the, and you combine those together and that forms what's called the shadow shape. Uh, so we see this, we see a form shadow up here, we see a cast shadow here, but that can be seen as one overall form called the shadow shape. And then within the, the shadow, within a form shadow, you have, or, or cast shadow, with any shadow, you have the opportunity for some bounce light. So that's light coming from other sources that are bouncing back into it. So we see that in this area here. So there's something over in this area, something over in this area that is reflecting back. And I, it looks like it's mostly the light here, striking off this, is kind of catching in this bowl, bouncing back and striking up into here. Now, one of the things that I see is often a, a challenge for some beginning students is overstating that bounce light. It's like once you see it, there's a tendency to, to want to overstate it. And our, um, our, our, our minds are really good at observing subtle shifts in value. And so we want to try to replicate the subtle qualities of actual life when we're, um, when we're working with, those bounce, with that bounce light. Um, so we kind of sneak up on that. And so what we, the, the way I test that is if I squint my eyes, does that bounce light still hold in that shadow shape or does it project forward? Um, now, excuse me, it's a little bit hard to see in this, at this stage because I haven't added the lights. I'm starting again with this toned paper. So it's, harder, it's hard to um, really evaluate the bounce light at this point, that reflected light, but I think it's, um, it's something that we're gonna come back around to later on as, as we start to add the lights. I'm gonna be evaluating that a bit more. So that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. And hopefully that explains that. So now I'm, I'm looking at some of the kind of the lighter areas in these shadow forms, and I'm just trying to erase that out a bit getting to that, that white of the toned paper. Not the white, but just the, the blank toned paper. All right. I'm gonna kind of refine this a little bit. And I'm not being careful. I don't need sharp edges for this. Actually, sharp edges will work against me. Now here we have another, see we, we have the shadow shape. Um, we have a form shadow over here on this fold. And we see this form casting a shadow onto this. So here we have the cast shadow. Here we have the form shadow. And now in this case, it's difficult to see a difference in the value structure, but in, in many still life objects, you would notice a distinct contrast in value. So it's just something to look for. And right up in here, I think I, I think it can get dark right up in here. Now, right in here, there's we can see three, uh, you know, two distinct dimensions of this fold. We see this kind of vertical wall, and then it makes a turn across the top, and then it drops off into that darkness. So I'm and I'm adding that this negative drawing here. I'm drawing in that background shape here. I'm leaving some of that tone, and that's naturally defining that top wall. I don't think I'm going to add a lot more definition to this form up here. But I think the unification of forms through light is something that's really important. And this is one of the reasons I prefer this process of building everything up rather than finishing as I go. Um, because it helps to encourage that, um, that, yeah, that unification of light and shadow. Starting with this basic shadow shapes and then starting to, to break those apart even farther. And so this is all about kind of as I'm making my marks, it's all about kind of having a subtle touch, softening those edges. So I'm kind of trying to find the when I when I'm looking for a dark form, trying to find that that central portion of it 
and then feathering out. So try to find that central axis and then soften by, by pulling out and away in both directions. Um, and if you are new, I'm Scott, this is Artist Network. We do this every Monday, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and seeing some wonderful drawings up on Artist Network. So if you go, there's a, there's a link, the URL is posted in the description below uh, to the Drawing Together page on Artist Network. Uh, and there you can link to the individual show pages where I see a, some a really fantastic work being posted. And that's really what this whole series is about is, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's a realization that I had that I had neglected drawing uh, for quite some time, um, you know, being seduced by, <laughs> being seduced by the, uh, the color of, of landscape paintings and oil. And uh, so we started this series, get, gathering together to draw, improve our skills. Uh, but one of the things is that, you know, the, I don't, I'm not intending to show any of this work. This isn't for a gallery. This isn't, this is, this is really just helping to develop skill, hand-eye coordination, um, understanding proportions a little bit better, understanding value relationships, understanding the structure of forms. Then we try different subjects. Uh, we did some we did some architecture on Monday. We're doing some still life today. I'm going to be doing more architecture on um, on next Monday. I'm going to get back into some figurative work. I did try my hand at some colored pencil, and I think I need a little bit more practice. It's a lot of fun. So, but I'm I'm hoping that we I can do some demos in colored pencil at some point. So I'm trying to observe some of the subtle variations in right in here. There's some wonderful bounce light that's happening. You see kind of in the at the bottom of this ravine here, there's this river of light that's um, that's catching some bounce light. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase that back down just to the the pure paper. And then right up against it, it gets a little bit darker. Then we see some more bounce light in here, so I feel like I can kind of lift some of this off. Kind of lost the point a bit, um, so I'm going to use the side of the pencil, kind of sharpen as I go. So this is where it gets a little bit, uh, get a little bit trickier right in here, see, observing this transition of light across here. Um, we have some fairly strong bounce light in this area. Um, and we see transitions, there's a lot of changes in direction happening here. So let's just try to sneak up on these values a little bit. Right in here, there's a little strip of light, so I'm going to erase that out. And I, I see some proportion issues. This is what, what's where I'm kind of getting thrown off a little bit. Um, is that I'm looking at this shadow curve here relative to this curve, and in the reference photo there is a greater there's greater distance. Actually, what I think I need to do is this needs to, I think needs to come down in size just a little bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to adjust this, you know, so this is now where I'm observing some of those proportion issues and to me it's a, it's a bit important because this fall off of light across here is one of the, the, the key interesting features in this. And so um, if I'm off in the proportions over here or over here, I'm less concerned. But this is, this is kind of important to me and so I do want to get this right. And I think what I need to do is I'm going to need, I need to move this over and smaller just a little bit and move this across. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time kind of refining this. Um, and, and you might decide for yourself what, 
um, what makes sense to you. Because that may not be an interesting feature for you. And maybe you've, or maybe you've kind of hit it right. All right, so that, that already, I'm kind of moving kind of this line up a little bit. This, this little strip of light that I had can, needs to come over here underneath this little reflected light. And then that means this all moves, this curve, this S curve that I just you know, spent that time on uh, moves over. It's a very subtle shift overall, but I think it's going to make a big difference in the overall drawing. It's just going to give us more to work with on this. This is it's this fold in here that's really the, the focal point. I think to me it defines uh, the scene, and so I want to make sure that I, I give enough compositional space for it. All right, that's better because then I'm looking at I'm looking at this landmark here as well. I've got this darker shadow. If I come down here, I feel like I can probably even come over a little bit more. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fill in this this uh, reflected light that I had before. Now I'm going to go and reestablish it, moving that over just a touch. Um, Carol's asking, is the reference photo the same size as the paper? I, you know, actually, I think it is. Uh, I should have sized it um, properly for you all to be able to print out on an eight and a half by eleven sheet, and that's essentially the size that I'm working on right now, and that's um, uh, you know I, I don't. Actually, I don't know if I have typically done that in this series. Actually, it's uh, I've typically worked 11 by 14 or a little bit larger than eight and a half by 11. All right, so now I've got this dark mark here that doesn't make any sense anymore. So I'm gonna kind of lift that. You know, as just like when I'm when I'm drawing with a pencil, when I'm using the kneaded eraser, I'm trying to sneak up on on lifting the value as well. So starting with a light pressure. And gradually, you know, gradually increasing it as I need to, as I see how it's lifting. And I encourage you all to, you know, practice this. You know, if you're a painter, um, this is a wonderful subject uh, to work with. You learn so much about light and structure um, working with folded fabric like this. Now, one of the, I found this on a, on a website, Pixabay, it's where I go. I, most of my reference photos I try to take myself. Um, in, in my case, I, I wasn't as pleased with the fabric options I had available. Um, so I found this on Pixabay. And what I liked about it is that there is a distinct light and shadow structure. Uh, so it's something to kind of pay attention to as you're observing uh, photo references and seeing what works. Um, sometimes you might you might find something where you like the composition, you like the color, all of that, but maybe there's not quite enough um, light and shadow information to use um, to give you a, kind of an understanding of the form. So I, I like to have distinct shapes of light and shadow as much as possible because it just gives me more to sink my teeth into, more tools available for me to to create depth and space in the drawing. If you start with a photo reference that's flat, you can make that painting look or painting or drawing look exactly like the photo, and it's going to come out flat. All right, I'm going to switch to the shading stump, kind of refine this form. So hopefully that all makes sense.
Um, now, I, I, it's been a while since I've had the question, but you know, um, if you're wondering why do I not transfer, um, you know, or why do I not use a grid, uh, the reason is is because I'm looking to develop a particular skill um, in my drawing that will transfer to my painting when I'm working from life. Uh, so I don't have any issue with anybody using whatever tools available, you know, so transferring uh, your drawing or using a grid, go for it if you want. But in this case, as an exercise, I'm going to learn so much more. I'm going to develop hand-eye coordination to a better degree, not relying on those tools. And so it's just a calculated choice, again, to develop the skills, because I know when I'm on, the, on location in the field, I don't have that real option to to transfer, to you know, print out a, a photograph, transfer that image to the paper, and kind of go from there. So I like the challenge of trying to, to kind of replicate that, take my observations and, and apply them directly. So all right, I think we're almost to the point where we can start to um, start to add some of that white. So I'm just kind of going through and refining some of these forms using the shading stump. And what happens with the shading stump is that because it fills in some of that texture, it actually creates a darker value. You might be observing that now. Um, so you get some optical mixing when the tooth of the paper shows through, and that creates the impression of a slightly lighter value than what's actually deposited on the page. So with, uh, when, you sh when you fill in the gaps using the shading stump, it has the, the visual impression of of actually darkening just a little bit. So, so as I'm going through, I'm, again, I'm looking at the, the flow of the fabric now, and I'm starting to change the direction of my mark. So as I'm looking at this fold here, I'm trying to see how does that change, and you run my marks along what's called the cross contour uh, of the fabric. So those are kind of contour lines inside the form, not along the edge, that suggests the three-dimensional form of the object. One of the things about this shading stump too is you see these little ridges on here. If you if you use the side of the shading stump, sometimes you can get those little ridges to transfer onto the surface and create uh, some really cool suggestions of texture. I just I feel like texture reads so much better when it's implied and when you use things like just the natural tooth of the paper or texture on a on the brush or from the uh, you know from other tools like a shading stump when we can utilize those it uh, for me it feels more convincing than trying to render a texture using kind of a sharp point or something All right. All right, just checking in here. Um, I know I was asking, they're saying the color of hue of the fabric reminds me of the ancient Greek marble statues, the light cast, contrast between pure white and yellowish white. That's a great observation. Reminds me a lot, you know, in my undergrad in Baltimore, we had the opportunity to go to the Walters Art Museum and draw from statues there, marble statues, and that was amazing. It's a great way to learn form, is by actually drawing from those marble casts or statues. You can see the shadow shapes perhaps a bit more clearly than when it's within full color. All right, so where are we at? Oh, here's what I'd like. In this form here, I think there's, there's this Small dark triangle that I want to get in there because that helps to qualify the values just a little bit. Sometimes it's a little thing that can um, it can pull something together, and all of a sudden, then that starts to read like the shadow on the fabric. I'm gonna refine this a little bit. So I'm just kind of shaping this, pushing it on the edge, flicking out. And I think one of the things that helps to create this, this depth is the contrast between this shadow edge here and then this foreground one. Um, and so there's this kind of a slight scoop in here 
along in here. And I, I want to kind of act, accentuate this, now this compound curve, this other curve that goes in another direction on top of it that creates kind of a clear overlap. And that'll help to, to create some of that depth. Okay. Um, feeling pretty good about this. So let's start adding some of the light. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is I want to go into the areas where I know I'm going to be adding the white chalk and uh, if you have white charcoal or white chalk, both will work. Um, I have the white chalk. I actually feel like white charcoal works a bit better. And I'm just lifting off the, uh, lifting off the, any sort of um, graphite that's on there. Kind of a sharper edge here that I want to establish though. And now, so some of the some of the tone of the paper is going to play into this, but I'm doing this because I don't want any of that graphite to mix with the the chalk or the pastel, um, and mostly because it doesn't really accept on the page. It it kind of slips across the surface than the the white does. So um, I want to be kind of careful about that. And so I, even though I did some work into these light areas, some of these subtle values and such, um, I may have to reestablish them. Uh, there's some texture here that I can start to suggest as well. So I don't, it doesn't have to be a perfectly kind of smooth surface. So at those the transition areas, I'm just kind of reshaping this into this kind of um, kind of wedge and using that to help kind of feather the transition between light and shadow and that's going to help suggest the uh, suggest that texture all right and then I'll have to, I'm going to come back in a little bit more later to refine some of these dark areas and that once I get the light established actually when I get rid of that What do I want to do here? Okay, so now with the with the uh, the white chalk, I'm going to kind of work from the background forward. Uh, I do think I need some right up in here, perhaps. And I'm just going to be a very similar approach to the uh, graphite. You're going to sneak up on the values a little bit. I'm just trying to lift there using the side of the pencil. I'm just a, just a light touch. I'm just seeing what the weight of the pencil will do. Now this is in that shadow area, so I don't need it to be bright. This is going to be the brightest bright. That's where I'm going to really, you know, apply pressure there. And then there, I want to be pay attention to this edge and it's, you know, kind of sharp in some areas more diffused in others. So I'm going to use some hatch marks, but I, I'm, I can use the grain of the fabric, whatever observations I'm making in the grain of the fabric to help inform the direction of the, uh, the hatch marks that I make. So at, in each section here, I'm just looking at the grain. There's a cross grain, so it makes this 90 degree angle. And I'm running my marks in that direction. And so I'm, you know, I don't have to be super precise with it. I'm going to use the side of the pencil a bit more because I'm making that point too dull. You can, again, you can achieve some really sharp marks um, just using the side of the pencil. Now in this case, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm applying a little bit more pressure at the top and pushing down, lifting off towards the back edge there. And that starts to read now as light um, back in there. There's still quite a bit of, of that paper showing through. Now I'm going to come across here. Let's see. There's a little bit of light here. And I like this little bit of light right up in here. So I'm going to lift off some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the graphite there. And so I'm trying to pay attention to how, you know, where I'm lifting on the pencil, on that, on that stroke. 
So in this one, for example, it's a kind of a soft edge. So I'm, I'm kind of visualizing the center of this light area. I'm lifting up and off uh, um, and then down and off so that I don't have kind of hard edges along in there. And then kind of feathering that out a little bit. So what happened to there, you can see, I don't know if you can kind of see it on there, but it's kind of picking up some of that graphite where I did that. I'm just kind of going over that graphite right now to kind of show you what it could do. It's kind of blending it, but it's also picking some up on that, that tip there. Um, I'm gonna come back in on this area. It's hard to tell the grain here, so I'm gonna to switch to a circular direction for these marks here. Uh, so again, one of the things that I'm really trying to pay attention to is the, that transition along the fold, you know, where edge is a little bit harder, where are they softer. So if, for example, right in this area, there's this, there's this line of termination, we go from relative light into shadow over here. It's a little bit sharper along this edge, this line of termination, more diffused over on here. Uh, now it's not a sharp, sharp edge, but it's sharper. So I just want to be mindful of that. So using the side of the pencil here, kind of lifting to transition into it, but I'm kind of quickly going into a lighter value. And then as I move up here, it's just a softer transition. And there's this back and forth. It's just using the weight of the pencil here. And softening that with my, my fingers there. So right in here, it's really just the tone of the paper, but I think it's reading as reflected light. And I think there's a little bit of shadow that I can um, intensify here. Okay. I'm gonna move across here. And I see that there's light. Again, it's not as not as bright here as it is here, so I'm not really bearing down. I'm again I'm sneaking up on the values a little bit. Uh, but I wanna I wanna bring out a little bit of light on, on here. It's a little bit stronger, gradually fades away, and that'll help to suggest that that form. And then right in here, the same. It's a little bit brighter right here in the center. And it fades out at the top, a little bit softer towards the bottom. And I think I want to define this edge just a little bit more. So this kind of reminds me a bit of uh, the drawings of George Sroth that um, I, in my freshman year I did a bunch of master copies of. He does it's just these beautiful drawings that um, create they just create a really strong sense of atmosphere. So some of these areas kind of remind me of those drawings. All right, how we're moving across. Uh, here we go. We're going to go right into this section here. This is the this is the hero of the scene. This is where it's going to be the brightest. I want this to be the strongest. So I want to I want to drop that in there now, really bearing down using the side of the pencil because I don't need a lot of precision down in this area. And I'm kind of lifting a little bit softer up on this edge. It's a little bit harder right in here. Remember to roll my pencil as I go. And I'm letting that, that tan paper create that transition. It's a little bit of, there's a little thin strip of tan paper between this highlight and then and that shadow. And I'm running these marks vertically to help reinforce the, the dimension of the, uh, the fold there. 
Now there's this cast shadow right in here. And there's this little thin strip of light coming across this ridge that I want to drop in there. So I'm just taking these kind of short horizontal marks and kind of feathering them out. I want to look up here, see how that reads. And I think I do need to kind of sharpen this up to give it a little bit more dimensionality. I'm putting that sharp mark just in, providing a thin strip of of that tanned paper um, between the pastel and the graphite. So I'm just kind of finding that path and I'm lifting up from that path. All right. And that gets a little bit more, a sharper focal point there. Um, Jessica's asking if I'll use my shading stump on the white areas as well. Potentially, I want to assess that, I think, as I go. Um, I do want to kind of sharpen up this edge in here, though. So this is where I'm going to actually drop a line in that doesn't quite exist. But I want to, I want to provide a little bit more detail there, something, to, something more concrete for the eyes to rest on is a little bit too um, kind of ambiguous there. Hopefully it looks like it's out of focus. There might be a buffering issue. Ah, did it freeze up? No, looks like it didn't. Now it's back. So if you do notice any sort of lag in the in the video, don't worry, it'll come right back. Okay, so similar, actually, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna switch. I've got my kind of muddied up shading stump here. I'm gonna kind of drop in this cast shadow. And let's see, I do wanna, yeah, I think I'm gonna leave that, leave that alone there. Yeah, I'm going to leave that. I was going to, I was contemplating um, using the shading stump in there. I see some. How to apply? I'm going to, I want to accentuate some of these lines in here subtly to help reinforce that structure. All right. So now in here, we see there's a lot going on in this light area. Uh, I, what I want to do is I want to start with the brightest light, just like I did over here, and it's right here on the inside of the kind of the cove of that. I'm really bearing down. Uh, and I'm trying to hold in my mind the path that I'm going to be following along. So I'm looking up at the reference photo, looking back here, trying to hold that path in my mind rather than draw a line and create that path to follow that way. Um, I'm trying to just identify that path and then and then kind of stop my marks along that path. Uh, and so this, you can see it's brighter here and starts to feather out back into here. So I'm going to lift up some of that graphite. And I think we can, uh, you know, this is actually a nice, I can fill in this whole area using the side of the pencil and that'll help to sharpen it. So then I can use that sharp point later on. I kind of blew that out over here. So. So I'm running them vertically because on the back side of this cove, it's kind of a vertical wall and it kind of undercuts and then it wraps around. And so that's what we're doing is we're doing the vertical side of this undercut. So I'm going to run these marks vertically. And I can start to then transition into the rounded part of the cove. And then right in here, it strikes the light again. So light is often strongest right at the kind of the, the, the point of the, the turn. So in, in a concave or a convex turn, you'll see often the light catch. And we see that in portraiture a lot as well. Like, you know, we'll see a bright spot here on the bridge of the nose as well as the tip of the nose. So a concave and a convex surface that can seem to catch that light.
Uh, super chat. I don't know what is super chat. Somebody's asking, is your super chat button is off or not working? I don't know what that. Um, not sure what that is. <laughs> I should probably figure that out. All right, so I'm just kind of working across here, and I need to try to visualize that that path as it comes down here because there's there's kind of a convergence now where this fold here kind of wraps down and cuts in on top of this one. So actually what I want to do is I want to establish that. I'm going to work from this side and we see a, we need, we see a bright spot here again at that curve. And try to use some cross hatching to suggest the texture. You can see that that this form kind of they continue down into one another. So, just want to see how that reads again. I think it reads all right. Seems to get a little bit brighter right back in here. And kind of feathering it out to create that transition. Um, now we can come back under here and we have some light and what I want to do is kind of suggest some of the texture because I can see that a little bit more clearly in this part of the photo. It's a little bit brighter down in here right up against that shadow. Part of that is the simultaneous contrast. Um, you know where things look brighter when they're against a dark form, darker against a light form. But um, in general, it does look like the light is a little bit stronger here. And I'm just going to feather that out a little bit. So this is where we can start to see some of the threads catch the light just a little bit more, or they catch the shadow just a little bit more. So like right in here, we can kind of suggest some of that texture um, dropping in, you know, as, I, as I'm looking for the path, just kind of tapping along and suggesting those, some of these, suggest, you know, these subtle bands in the, the pattern of the fabric. Darken that right in there. All right. Back to this. I want to just kind of clean up this edge. See how that reads. All right, that works out all right. So now you can see, you know, this area here looked quite a bit brighter before I added the light. Now it's kind of sitting in there as reflected light. Um, if I squint my eyes at the reference photo, some of these light spots like this pretty much disappear. So I want to do the same with my drawing, and that I think it does that to some degree. If I wanted to, if I wanted to draw a bit more attention, I could add just a little touch of that, but I don't think I, I don't think I want to do that um, at this point. Let me. Uh, I don't want that to be a distraction from the uh, from the main focal point. Oh, Mariana's saying I have a long, ugly stage. No, that's too bad to hear it. What happens? Um, if anybody's wondering what um, uh, Mariana's asking, or talking about is that one of the things we talk about in this series is the idea that most drawings, pretty much every drawing, goes through what I refer to as an ugly duckling stage where you know, it just feels like it could all just fall apart. Um, and you got to fight through it. Um, Sometimes you win the fight, sometimes you don't. Uh, but you got to fight through it, and if you don't win it, then it's just an opportunity to, I say, just push even farther and see if you can learn something about how the materials work, um, you know, something about, you know, principle in the design, things like, you know, anything that will help to kind of make that a win. Um, 
So what I'm doing here is I'm suggesting, suggesting some of that texture. Uh, I'm trying to observe the direction of that, the grain of the, the, of the uh, fabric. And I'm kind of, I'm holding my, I'm orienting my pencil in accordance with that. And as I move along that ridge, I'm rolling the pencil to grab a, have a new spot of that pe uh, pencil kind of engaged. And actually what I'm going to do is kind of work my way across this way. How's everybody? I've seen, uh, I'm seeing some good comments here coming through about you know people who are following along. Curious how yours are working out. You know, patience is a thing here. You know, and, and each drawing is a little bit different. Um, you know, f some some subject matter just kind of naturally lends itself to the need for patience or kind of focus, and some are a bit more forgiving in that and, and may um, you know allow for more expression. Um, but, you know, I think you kind of find, find what works for you. Sometimes it's just not there. I did a painting not too long ago where my mind was just in another space and it just wasn't, wasn't in a spot where I could really f focus the way that scene kind of demanded. And the painting didn't work out and it's, it's all right, you know. So it's, again, one of the mantras here is that marks, marks are thoughts. Every mark you make starts as a thought. Sometimes our, our minds are just elsewhere. So as you can see what I'm doing here is, I'm, again, I'm looking for the grain of the, the, of the fabric. And I'm just running my, my pencil along that grain and I'm gradually rolling it. And this is really, I'm, I'm pushing more than anything. And I'm using the side of the pencil and you can see how it, how it creates these fine lines. that it suggests the texture. Just kind of moving across and we're just going to keep building up the texture that way, the, the value that way. And then right in here there's a there's kind of a little crease where that light really catches. So I'm going to drop that in. There's a bit, a bit of one over here as well, this kind of triangular form. We're going to have to work that shadow to make it make it play out a bit better. I think what I want to do though is before I add too much of that texture, I just need to build up some of the lights. I'm going to try to add a, an even tone using the chalk. Just to start from a, a more effective base. And now the, the hatch marks that I'm using here are in alignment with the, the grain of the fabric. You know, it runs in two directions. So if I'm using these kind of big marks to run in this direction here, and I'm going to use these fine marks to come in across here because the light catches on these the march running this way the light catches a bit more so they become a bit more visible and as I go I'm keeping my eye on the the reference photo trying to observe you know where the light is a little bit stronger and build that up So this is, again, using, using hatching, using the suggestion of texture, rather than really trying to get in there and, and render each and every thread. And that just gives the, the, the viewer's mind something to work on. Um, you know, something I've been contemplating a lot throughout this whole series is, you know, we get a lot of questions about detail, things like that. And I think you should work the way that you're comfortable working. If you're the type of person that really has the patience and focus to, to render every little detail, I say go for it and own that. Um, if not, then there are tools available to you to, for you to suggest it. And I, I don't have that patience. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the techniques that I've incorporated are built out of my, you know, kind of the claustrophobia I refer to it in certain areas where it, when I, I want the detail, but I'm not willing to work for it, <laughs> you know, if that makes sense. I'm not willing to, to kind of go there with, um, you know, working, you know, hundreds of hours on a painting to render detail. And if I can find a way to 
suggest it and it reads just the same, then I'm going to go for that. Um, and I, to me, when I, I, those are the areas that I get most excited about in other people's works. All right, so I'm looking at some of these, the, the patterns forming in some of these areas here that kind of suggesting just using the side of the pencil to do that too. So in this area, I'm working on top of the graphite. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about doing is I'm rolling that, that gra the, the chalk on top of the graphite, and that helps to push that down so it doesn't mix up the, uh, it doesn't mix the two quite as um, naturally. So I'm just kind of tr softening the transition here between these light and shadow areas. Down in here, it needs to be a little bit brighter. It's really catching the light there. And there's another kind of subtle crease right in here that I can where I can bear down just a little bit more. And I guess that's, that's reading pretty well as texture now. Again, so I haven't had to didn't switch to my tripod grip and try to draw each and every one. Just uh, what I'm holding in my mind is the direction of the grain, and just allowing the materials to kind of to do its their thing. So I'm rolling the pencil as I go, so I'm always engaging a kind of a sharper edge on that core of the pencil. And all right, I'm feeling, feeling pretty good about that. And there are a few areas where there's, I, I can come back in now and drop in some shadow. So I'm just using the shading stump. work in some of these areas, but right along this crease, we see it catching the light, then it drops down, just it gets, it gets a little bit darker right on this edge. And what I wanna do, and I talked a bit about this when I got to the point, I wanna carry that structure into the shadow. That's gonna make that shadow feel more convincing. So what I might actually do is use the eraser to continue that line in the shadow area, the light line, and use the graphite here to continue that dark edge. And that's a, a, a little thing that you can do to, to really uh, improve the, the realism in the drawing is to, to look for that transparency in the shadow. Um, and it, in that, that little bit of work, it just took a, you know, a minute or so, um, now transforms that from a two-dimensional shape into something that has uh, more dimensionality to it. All right, I wanna suggest this fabric here. It's not quite as bright as, as this, but there's a distinct ridge. But I think we're, you know, we're nearing the end because I'm gonna leave this to be relatively abstract. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, I'm going to hang on for a little bit while, a little while here. Um, but I think we're, we're pretty, you've pretty much seen it, the bulk of it now. Um, thank you for the compliments, everybody.
Mary, you're saying your white pastel seems a bit bright. If it does, you can use your kneaded eraser to lift off some of that, and that might tone that down for you a bit. Yeah, I'm noticing a big difference now under these kind of studio lights that I have compared to the preparatory one that I had done um, under just natural light in the living room. And that white just wasn't doing much. It just pops quite a bit more, and I'm much happier with it under this, these lighting conditions. Oh, that's right. Now, going back to, I, I talked about this area up here. Um, to me, I feel like that reads pretty well. It helps to create some contrast between the detail, the sharper texture here, and this is a, that's a bit softer there. Um, but you may decide for yourself that you want to add a little bit more of that, more of that detail. And so you can, you can go in and start to kind of suggest that form. You just be careful drawing lines. Um, you, you want to make them feel natural. So if I'm, if I'm going to suggest any of these forms and, and lines there to help add a little bit, bit of detail, I'm just using the side of the pencil and I'm rolling as I go um, along that path. Uh, I don't think I want to do much more, but um, if you're wondering if you want to add more in there, just kind of look for the, again, the kind of the darker lines when you see them. And then it's, I guess, a little bit darker, kind of to the right of that darker edge. And then you get a little bit of thin, thin band of light along in here. You can use your eraser to kind of lightly suggest that. And you can start to add a little bit of detail there. Um, should there be more shade on the right? Uh, yeah, maybe. Like right over here, I didn't... It really didn't add much value here. Drop that value there. Um, darken this for sure. Let me evaluate now. What do you all think? Is there any, anywhere there I might be able to define it, push the values a bit more one way or the other? Feeling pretty happy with it overall. This feels a little flat to me, so it might. Let me see if I can. Uh... Let's see if I can darken that. That adds a little bit more dimension. I like that. And then I think right in here, this flattens out. So this is that's what I need. You can see some bounce light striking here. And right in here, it gets a little bit darker. I just need to add a little bit of contrast, not right up against that edge. But, you know, set in just a little bit from it. There, that helps to, that helps to add some dimension to that. And then right down in here is another area where I feel like I could add a little bit more contrast. All right. Uh, Chris is asking if I can suggest some sketch papers. You know, I honestly, you know, uh, this is this is a Strathmore. Strathmore makes some great sketch papers. Canson does. I use a lot of Hanamula paper. It's a little bit harder to find, but um, I really like Hanamula. Um, You know, it depends on a lot of what what you're working with. If you do find that you're working in charcoal, you want to get something that has a bit more of a tooth to it. If if you do use more graphite, then you can get away with something that's a little bit smoother. But you know, so many of the paper companies they do a good job of really engineering the paper to work with the material. So pay attention to what it says on there. It really does does matter. So, but I think I think that's pretty good. Let's see. Yeah, Rosalie, I can make the bed, yeah. Um, it's a good comment. So, all right, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to call it a day. I'll hang on just a few seconds to see if there are any lingering um, questions in, in the lag here. Join me again on Monday, Monday, 3 p.m. Eastern, Monday and Wednesday. What are we doing on Monday? I believe we're doing the grain building, so another architectural subject. We haven't done a whole lot, but we did do some architecture last Monday, doing it again, and then another still life on Wednesday. So 
um, join us for that, and then I want to get back into some figurative work, um, get, do some more portraiture. Um, uh, Krisha is saying, actually, I like to draw flowers and portraits. Yeah, so I've done a, a several flowers as part of the series. You might check out some of those older drawings. I've done a rose, a peony, a lily, um, and uh, you know, with portraits, we've done a few. So I've done a, a couple portraits. The first one, a self-portrait, did not go so well, but you might find that helpful to see how portraits can be a struggle. Um, I did another portrait of a girl. I did a, a, a man. I did a few that focus on smiles, mouths, things like that. So there's a fair amount in that back catalog. So if you look, um, either uh, if you go to artistnetwork.com, go into the Drawing Together page, you're going to see a whole list of all the episodes that we've done, and uh, you can find one that works for you. So a lot of people will join in, and then they'll kind of start off from the beginning. If you're looking for something that's a little bit easier, those early episodes were much more simple. So I started off just drawing a simple cup, um, moving on to things like a banana and a you know a lemon, things like that, where you know if, if you're looking for something that's a bit more gradual, you might uh, explore some of the older ones there. Also at Artist Network, we have a lot of the resources for, um, for drawing um, on that page, uh, as well as if you're looking for things for watercolor, um, oil painting, acrylic, pastel, etc. cetera, um, check those out. So thank you so much. Thanks for all the positive feedback. Thank you for all the great conversation. I love seeing everybody's comments. I can't wait to see your work. So check out the page on Artist Network, share your work, you know, register there. You have to be a registered um, uh, user there. You just have to uh, open up a, a login uh, there and then you can post the comments. And I love to see all the work that you posted. So thank you. I will see you all on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.